Hello and welcome. My name is Chris Letz from the Compact Systemhaus GmbH, Germany. Hello, my name is Florian Pilchner. I'm CEO of Lunifera GmbH, uh, located in the near of Vienna. Let me first give you an introduction to you to the Open Standard Business Platform, which I will abbreviate with OSBP. The OSBP is a collaboration of a community uh, developing software and standards to develop uh, business applications. We have different paradigms under which we are doing this. The first one is the public availability of everything which we are doing. Um, the second one, we're doing this in a collaborative process so that the results that we are presenting will fit and match to the needs of all the ones participating. The next one is that we are using standards uh, as long as they are already existing on the market. Using standard is better than developing its own standards, at least it's a lot cheaper. The next one is we are collaborating with universities and therefore having a scientific approach. And an important one is also the, uh, using processes and defining processes to develop software as we think it's that synonymy between developing software and having a certain result at the end of this process. And what do we understand under business applications? We, for us, business application is any type of software you can use under business conditions. Hello, in the next few minutes I'd like to uh, introduce you about our technology stack, about all the technical uh, aspects involved in uh, uh, the OSPP. Um, the OSPP uh, contains of different uh, high-end uh, open source projects licensed under the Eclipse Public License, the Apache License and the Lower GPL License. Uh, the main idea is to combine all of them um, to, to, to something called a technology stack. Yeah? All the features you need to use to write your business applications are contained there. Um, In some, uh, all that features um, will be some kind of a software factory. You do not have to write uh, Java code anymore. Uh, we are providing uh, different approaches. I'll talk about it on the next slide. How to create your application. Uh, the main idea behind it is uh, using DSL, domain-specific languages, based on uh, semantic models and generators for it. Um, well, a business application um, consists of different domains um, and uh, every domain has its own semantics. Everybody who has ever been writing uh, GPA entities for a big project knows you have to code a lot, a lot Java code to get really good working entities. You need to um, use different annotations. You have to use uh, really good patterns to make lazy loading entities and so on. So what's, what's, what if we could extract the semantics behind that idea, the semantic model, and um, providing um, a domain-specific language on top of it? You do not have to write uh, 500 lines of code. No, it's, eno it's enough to write about 25 lines of code and let your computer do the coding work for you. The computer will generate all the Java code, uh, all the XML files required uh, from free. You just have to use uh, very comfortable um, domain-specific languages. Uh, this um, aspect we are calling the assembly, the generator. And um, the generator will provide you with a full functional application at the end. So, before uh, I'm going into uh, deeper details, um, I'd like to talk about Eclipse. Uh, we, choiced, uh, uh, we choose to use the Eclipse, um, Eclipse platform as our default application. Um, in general, you can say Eclipse is divided into two different parts. It consists of the Eclipse platform, Eclipse platform was maintained a uh, long time only by IBM employees. Um, now things changed and uh, you can extend your Eclipse platform uh, by so-called plugins. Uh, the whole Eclipse platform is based on an OSGI runtime. It's called the Equinox runtime. 
Um, and on the left side of the slides, you can see two very common plugins. It's the JDT, the Java development tools. They allow you to code Java in your Eclipse IDE and the plugin uh, development tools. Indeed, the, the JDT tools are very, very near to the Eclipse platform, but it's, I think it's a good example. And the whole composition of Eclipse platform and plugins is called your Eclipse IDE. So, um, in uh, the OSPB, we um, have two different use cases. We have um, an IDE. Each developer needs to use uh, an IDE to write down the models, to use the domain-specific languages based on Xtext. And on the other hand, we have a runtime. The runtime, um, just think about a JBoss uh, web server. That's a uh, com comparable with the runtime. And we also have common parts. Common parts means a parts that are needed for the IDE and also needed for the runtime. So we have um, things for uh, tools for development time and a server for the runtime. Um, the runtime is based on OSGI. I'll talk about um, why we are using OSGI a few slides later. We are using Equinox and um, the main difference to default web server is we do not put our application into a web server. No, we put the web server into our application. It's the Jetty web server and uh, it's, just, it's just a plugin. It's just a bundle. We're talking about bundles later. It's just a plugin in um, the, um, the OSGI uh, runtime. And now a really interesting thing, we are using the Eclipse E4 kernel in the runtime. Uh, many of you may think, okay, uh, Eclipse is an IDE. Yeah, Eclipse may be an IDE, but Eclipse may also be used in runtime. Uh, we are putting uh, the so-called Vaclips project on top of it. Vaclips project is a project that uh, implements um, E Eclipse E4 kernel renderers for runtime. You could say you have an Eclipse based on Vadin, um, the whole um, workbench UI and um, um, the, the views, the editors and so on are supported there. Um, and for sure we had to put in some very special OSPP features. For business applications we need database base access, we need uh, OLAP databases, we need uh, authentication based on Shiro. We need uh, a UI, we need a web UI um, and for us we are talking about UI models. We are interpreting um, EMF models and rendering them at runtime and we need DSL engines. Uh, it may be strange that we use domain specific language engines in the runtime. Yeah, we have a model driven approach and uh, we like to access the metadata, the semantics about a GPA entity at runtime for sure, um, based on the information um, how, an, how an entity looks like. For instance, a supplier entity, we can generate um, or render UI, Vadin UIs uh, on the fly, and there are a lot more features in there. The next part is the IDE part. Um, the IDE part is, is, is your Eclipse, your Eclipse application, and we put in uh, a lot of uh, additional features. We put on um, all the... We put all <coughs> in all the features required to get a good feeling, a good preview about the um, application that you are creating, that you are uh, um, uh, dissembling at this time. There is a Chatty web server for Vadin preview. We have a Vadin integrated uh, to, to, to render the models at IDE level. We have several Xtext DSLs. Mr. Letts will talk about it later. Um, and uh, for sure, an, an additional um, IDE features like an Xtext, um, index, view, and so on and so on. So we are pretty good set up with our uh, OSPB IDE. So, um, I often get asked why uh, are we using OSGI? Why do, don't we use, um, for instance, JBoss application server? Um, and I often get asked, what is it? What is that OSGI in detail? So, 
um, it's 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 it takes a few sentences to explain what what is OSGI, but it's much simpler to explain what OSGI is not. OSGI is not a monolithic system. OSGI is much more like uh, a neuronal network. Here you can see a neuronal network on the slide. Um, you can think about uh, each neuron is a bundle. Yeah, it's a, it's a module. It's a it's a closed system, and each uh, bundle can define dependencies to other bundles. Um, therefore, we can use um, uh, uh, well-defined dependency management or we can uh, use dependency injection by OSGI, by so-called OSGI services. So we do not prepare uh, monolithic systems anymore. No, we have a lot of uh, bundles and we know which bundle requires uh, other bundles. And we can assemble different systems based on the amount of our bundles very easily. So uh, you can call um, OSGI also the Lego paradigm. To give you an idea how we are using um, OSGI and what, what, what modularity, what flexibility means, um, i give you a simple example. On the left side, you can see a module, it's a bundle, it's a DSL engines module. Um, you can use this, um, this bundle to get information about a GPA entity, for instance, about the semantic model about the GPA entity. This bundle provides a service. And on the other hand, we have a UI rendering module. This uh, module likes to get information about the semantic information of the GPA entity and uh, it may consume uh, the provided service. The provided service will automatically be injected into the UI rendering module. And there are a few really, really great uh, um, core features uh, in OSGI. Imagine you have uh, your DSL engine module in two different versions. We have the version N and we have the version N plus one. And now there is our UI rendering module and it like to get an instance about the service provided by version N or version N plus one. Um, the OSGI service registry is responsible for um, tidying the services together. Here in that special version you can see that um, the UI rendering module is using an older version. Yeah, all that stuff can be configured in a so-called manifest in the, in the bundle manifest. Um, and um, if you're talking about life cycles, for normal you have to restart your application server if you would like to change anything in it, any logic. In OSGI it's, it's, it's really great. Uh, here we can see the same uh, example as before. We have a DSL engine module version N uh, and it is consumed, its service is consumed by the UI rendering module. Um, Active means green. Now we are going to stop the bundle in version N. So the UI, um, the, the, the provided DSL engine service will be removed from the UI rendering module, but OSGI will ensure that you will immediately become injected the version N plus one. So the UI rendering module can work properly for every request. You, there is no need for downtime in any of um, the cases. So the question is, um, with all this functionality, what did we do with it and what is available as in the sense of a business uh, building platform? And uh, I will give you an example with what we have for the moment. So our platform, f first of all, consists of something uh, or a DSL with which you can model uh, an object entity model because everything starts with something. So if you want to apply functionality on something in your business application, you have to describe that something and this something is described with an object entity model. This object entity model then later on will be used to describe the database instance um, that you're going to use. Next one. Um, from there on we will link this with the authorization um, once you have modeled your authorization you would like to have in your business application 
this also will be exported to the appropriate system handling it in your uh, runtime environment. Next one. Um, and using the data out of the database system, normally you're not using all the data at once. You need to specialize and to use just a distinct number of data or attributes. This is done via using the data interface uh, uh, DSL or to exchange data with external uh, systems. The same if you are using as a database a OLAP or other system, you can um, describe cubes with which you want to work in your business application. Um, those cubes can then be specialized in so-called data marts on which you can then apply later on functionality. The same with the data transfer object or the DTO, which is also a distinct number of attributes coming from your database. And this, for example, can be headed on to the UI elements or the DSL describing URI, in our case, Vadin. Well, of course, we need functionality. So you have to describe your functions, which you put together to something which we, we, call, we call business logic. And uh, those can be exported and used internally or externally via web services. Well, those all are DSLs or models which are described and not seen by the uh, user interface or as a user experience but they're the ones you can see on the UI. For example, uh, you will be able to describe an organigram and to visualize it. And at the same time, uh, using the organigram, describing your authorizations and authentications. Then you will be able, or you are able, uh, to describe the dialogues, uh, to describe tables in your dialogues, to describe charts, so graphical elements, to describe topology or, for example, geographical elements, reports, you, reports and um, we, will also, we also have a calendar fun functionality and visualization and uh, workflow elements described in, the, in BPNM. Well, all these together are, are then put together in so-called perspectives and perspectives are put together to the application that the user is seeing on his uh, end device. And the same thing is done for mobile devices so that uh, when you are modeling an application, you can use it as well on a PC or in a browser as well as on any other device, for example, mobile devices. So the question is, um, what did, did, uh, what, how does it look like when you look at it in a live presentation? So we will give you a first, um, a first impression and then we will see what is the advantage, advantage of US, using USBP? Because our main goal is to build faster and more secure than others business application. And um, we'll give you a short example. Here we have what you can read. We have an entity supplier. And um, the only thing you will see now on the screen, um, we will start our, uh, business, um, our web browser and show it to you. So we have a supplier. And you see on the left hand, the supplier in form of a table just showing uh, company one through company N. Um, and as you can see, if you click on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, on uh, the dialog, you will see the company, the company name, which has been activated in the table and its ID. And the same thing at the bottom right as in form of a report. And of course, if you uh, type something into the company field, uh, this is saved and uh, synchronized with the table on the left-hand side. So what is needed to do a small application like this and what is needed to change this application and how fast can this be done. So let's look into the DSL model. Well, first of all, we have to describe our uh, entity object model, which is a, a quite simple one. For here, we have our supplier um, and the company we have just seen a couple of seconds ago. And uh, to continue with what we're doing, um, we are going to do the following. We're going to add certain information to the entity object model. Let's, let's, let's go back to the uh, PowerPoint, please. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, no problem. That's okay. So we're going to do the following. We're going to uh, change our object entity model, adding new information attributes to our model. And we will forward this information uh, through those different models. We will 
add the information to the data transfer object, to the, to the UI elements, add them to the dialogue, to the table, to the report, and at the end to the perspective and application that we're going to see. And well, normally, if you work with other uh, business application tools, you will have to do this in every single layer, repeating the same work all the time. And we will do this in our master DSL on the left-hand side in the object entity model, doing it once, repeating it uh, through the different layers using rules that we have implemented. And uh, we will see that the, uh, the application uh, will be developed in a couple of seconds. Okay, let's go back to the, uh, to the uh, development environment. So we added the, um, the attributes we wanted to add. So we have the city, we have the zip code, we have the street name, house number, etc. I and mean, you can imagine yourself what you would like to have when you want to handle a supplier. We will now start the runtime again. And this information is now headed forward to the different DSLs. We will start our browser, restart, restart it. And like from magic, you will see all this information now available in all uh, layers and, and the end user application. That's it. That's all we need to build an application. So the question is, what happened in the background? What is OSBP doing with all, all what uh, we explained just a couple seconds ago? So let's go back to the uh, Eclipse environment. So the first thing, of course, we changed our entity object model, as I just said. The second one, uh, we, the information was forwarded to the data marts so that this information uh, is not only extracted from the database, but also made available for the next layer. Then this is forwarded um, to, the, um, to the grid, oh, no, wait, to the grid, yes. And uh, here you can, yes. Um, that's a go ahead, it's fine. So um, then the information is headed on to the report so that on the bottom right you can see the report taking up their information. It's forwarded um, to, um, to, to the data mart, yeah, to the next one, etc., etc., um, just by adding it in the entity uh, describing model. That's it. So developing business application has become really easy and really fast. And the nice thing about it, it's really sure because you can't do anything wrong. You add those couple of lines and everything else is done by the OSB platform. Any comments so far on your side? Yeah, it's fine. It's fine for you. It's also fine yeah. for me. So um, thank you very much um, for watching. And now we will ask you to ask us some questions if you have any. So if there are no questions, we would like to ask you if, you if you would like to join the club and help us to develop this application platform. If you are yourself a business application developer, I think it, can, it might be interesting for you to facilitate your, the, your daily work uh, using uh, this model and the OSBB platform. Um, just can, can we have the PowerPoint, please? Um, so, so you can mail to us with OSBP at compex-commerce.com and um, or you can have a look at www.compex-commerce.com and uh, slash en and inform yourself in more detail as we have shown to you today and we'll be glad to, um, to welcome you in our team. So, so far Thank you very much. My name is Chris Lutz, responsible uh, at the Compex Company for this project, together with Frank Stuber and Jörg Riegel. And, um, Thanks a lot. My name is Florian Pechner from uh, Luniferus GmbH uh, in the near of Vienna, Austria. Thanks. <laughs>